Hello, and welcome to day two of the Moss Adams Alternative Investments Virtual Conference. We are pleased that you're able to join us again. We have two sessions today offering two CPE credits for today's portion of the conference, uh, 1.5 in the first session and 0.5 in the second session. For the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, to qualify for these credits, you must attend for a minimum of 75 minutes and respond to at least five of the six polling questions in the first session and attend a minimum of 25 minutes and respond to at least two of the three polling questions in the second session. If you meet all of the requirements, we will send a copy of your certificate via email within the next three weeks. And now I'm gonna play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. All right, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Syed Rizvi, partner here at Moss Adams. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second and final day of the conference. Um, I'm Syed Rizvi. I'm a partner in our asset management practice and I'll be the MC for your conference today. Um, if you missed uh, our conference yesterday, a recording is available and will be emailed to you uh, later today. Uh, as always, we welcome you to ask questions. Uh, you see the Q&A panel at the bottom right. Uh, we'll be monitoring the questions throughout the sessions um, and ask the, our, our speakers questions um, as, as the questions come up. If we don't get to your questions, we'll definitely get back to you um, after the conference. Without further ado, let me jump into the, uh, the agenda today for our conference. Uh, so we'll start off with the keynote session, uh, which will last uh, starting at 10.05 and will continue until 11.25 a.m. After that, we'll have a five-minute break. And then 11.30, we'll do an accounting and regulatory update, which will end at noon. Uh, that will be the end of the regular conference. However, we have the breakout sessions after that. Uh, so today, we have three breakout sections. Uh, the first one is fund structuring trends. Uh, the next one is current trends and PE transaction. And the last one is related to ESG. Uh, as always, uh, if you join the breakout, you don't have to be on the camera, so you can keep the cameras off if you just want to listen in. Uh, if you want to participate, you can keep the cameras on or off. Um, and uh, the, the, the format is pretty flexible. So, uh, so I highly encourage you to join one of the three breakout sessions, uh, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Okay, without further ado, um, let's let's get into our first uh, topic, which is the keynote panel discussion. Uh, in this in this topic, we'll be talking about the outlook on our modern finance offense following the pandemic. As we all know, this is, has been a hot topic uh, with, with talent management and what has been happening in the industry, not just us, but just an overall employment market. Uh, so we'll be talking a whole host of issues with some of our uh, speakers. So joining us today, we have, starting with Promit, who is the chief financial officer and the member of the leadership team at Top Tier Capital Partners. Top Tier is an investment fund with families of funds focused on primary commitments to venture capital, LPs, and direct secondary and direct investments. 
a top tier Promet leads the finance team and is responsible for the accounting operations and financial reporting of top tier capital and its fund. He joined top tier in 2020. Welcome, Promet. Joining Promet, we have Yuan, who is the chief financial officer at PFM Health Science and where she oversees PFM Health Science accounting, financial reporting, and operation functions. Prior to joining PFM Health Science in 2007, Yuan was an audit senior manager at an asset management practice for Ernst & Young. Prior to Ernst & Young, she was a controller and chief compliance officer at Triato Capital Management. Welcome, Yuan. Joining from and Yuan is Alex Kaminsky. He was the chief operating officer at Munich RE Ventures. Um, at Alex partners closely with the head of Munich RE Ventures in all aspects of running the group, including all investment and investment management process and system, financial oversight, oversight, talent acquisition and retention, facilities and marketing and events. Previously, Alex worked at global finance as a global finance lead, revenue operations supply chain at the Climate Corporation. So I would like to welcome all our speakers at this point. Um, before we actually start our topics of discussion, we have a polling question, uh, which for that, I'll turn it back over to Amy. All right, thank you. So our first polling question, what has been the greatest challenge for your firm over the past two years as it relates to talent management? A, managing remotely, B, retaining talent, C, attracting talent, D, Zoom fatigue, or E, other? And the polling questions are located right on your slides, and we will give you a few moments to respond. To respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. Oh, looks like someone pulled up the results. Let's put it back. Um, if you can't see the submit button, you will need to just enlarge your slide area to see that. I'll leave this up for another five seconds so everyone gets their CPE. All right, here are the results. Thank you, Amy. Um, interesting. Uh, you know, I expected a mixed bag. Um, not surprised to see a mixed bag. I think all of these are definitely issues that we're all dealing with in some capacity. Um, so, uh, so I'm not surprised um, to, to see a, a, a quite a mixed bag here. So starting off with talent management, that has, again, been top of our mind, top of everyone's mind across the industry verticals, across different professional service lines. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Promet here. Promet, you know, as, as you were talking about this, we are currently in the midst of what we describe as a great resignation. Um, you know, the, the report just came out today that we that the employment, um, unemployment, excuse me, the uh, job market uh, where people are seeking jobs like at 52 year low right now um, with the jobless claims. Um, so can you talk about how top tier is retaining talent, whether it's on the investment side or the operations? Uh, thanks, Syed. Um uh, so I joined Top Tier uh, right in the middle of COVID. Um, so I was probably, um, we had a couple of senior hires. I was one of them right in the middle of COVID. And so uh, my experience has been, at least from a Top Tier's perspective, the great hiring um, because I had to rebuild um, and attract talent uh, to our team. And so um, we've, uh, we've really focused on kind of, I would say, uh, the one-to-one -one interaction um, as we brought on people. Um, I think one advantage of when we were in the office, it was very easy to kind of work and be around people and actually you know, have um, conversations that uh, were focused not about work. And I think one of the challenges as we moved into kind of the Zoom environment has been that generally if someone's pinging you or someone's uh, need to get in touch with you, it has been particularly around work. And so, um, at our firm and even, you know, for myself, as I onboarded into top tier, one of the efforts uh, that we made consistently um, has been kind of spending more, uh, you know, concentrated sort of one-on-one -on -one time. You know, we, you know, I think earlier was when we were back in the office, it was kind of a purposeful, um, you know, put it on someone's calendar. And so we, we've 
kind of enhanced our um, our ability to do that. I do that with you know my individual partners um, as well. Um, in addition to that, we've um, you know uh, we've gone back into a hybrid work environment. At top tier, we have, and so uh, with that effort, we've as we've slowly made our way back into the office, kind of focused on um, uh, having events that bring um, people together, uh, just uh, again to start uh, that kind of that human interaction again. And as I said, we've uh, we've added significantly to the top tier team, and so we've got a lot of new people mm-hmm. making an effort uh, to make sure people. Uh, are getting together, and then we've also focused on kind of health and well-being. And so we've got a you know program for people who want to sort of exercise, you know, like a, uh, you know, if they've got some kind of a passion, or you know, and so we will, you know, support that. Uh, so we we've come up with you know mechanisms that I would say rate from kind of the one-on-one and sort of accentuating that through uh, the pandemic, just to make sure uh, interactions are not just about work, um, but it also kind of expands. Beyond that, we've obviously, um, you know, started doing a little bit more, you know, facilitated uh, group situations, obviously, um, making sure we're, we're all being safe. Um, and then also kind of focused on you know, health and well-being and kind of expanding and, you know, providing more benefits uh, to the team uh, mm-hmm. that go beyond kind of the work benefits. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and I can, re- I can personally resonate with a lot of those, and, and we are implementing a lot of that at our farm, too. So, Yuan, um, same question to you. Um in the midst of this great resignation, how are you managing your and, and retaining um, your talent in your firm? I think when we were in the office, um, people could observe what's going on with the firm. Uh, we could see investors visiting. We could see big meetings being held, key vendors being met. But when we work remotely, people don't see that unless they are involved. So how can we get in touch with uh, entire firm? Special effort has to be made. Um, Our firm have gone through restructuring pre-pandemic. And as soon as the restructuring was done, the pandemic got hit. So they, they... having many milestones uh, to rebuild the firm as we start chapter two of uh, PFM Health Sciences, getting people informed of a milestone before the milestone is being hit and post milestone is critical. We had a numerous town hall meeting uh, highlighting firm strategies, um, recognizing people who made achievements. Um, in addition, we had a, a off-hour um, firm-wide virtual activities. Um, and then with my team, we have a weekly uh, live video chat to make sure that everyone checking, um, observe uh, their Mm -hmm. body language and asking questions outside of work to make sure Mm -hmm. they're okay. Um, Those efforts typically was uh, seamless when when you were under one roof, but when you work remotely um, and just just need to, special effort need to be made in order to Mm -hmm. make it happen and and just make sure that we're connected even though we're not together. Um, interesting. Um, again, I can also resonate with a lot of those. Um, you know, checking wellness of our people has been, has been top of mind. Um, Alex, uh, turning over to you, same question. Um, how, how are you guys managing retention and uh, talent management? Um, yeah, when, when the pandemic started, you know, it really shines a light on what kind of culture do you have on your team? And we were you know, lucky enough to have a strong culture. So it wasn't a matter of, okay, we need to build something that's more resilient to this type of environment. It's mm-hmm. how do we preserve it? And um, a lot of it was around making sure that there was engagement outside of just the work, because it, it's easy to, to navigate to how do we continue to get the work done? Not necessarily how do we get the right engagement from, um, from the folks on the team. And so, engagement didn't 
necessarily mean more Zoom meetings because Zoom fatigue was was very real. Um, and we look for opportunities to, to get together. And whether it was picnics or happy hours outside, socially distanced within within the rules in play, we still found opportunities to, to get together and um, and have conversations that weren't work related. Um, mm -hmm. And just an, an opportunity to, to maintain the culture and build a culture because um, when things when things get tough um, and when it comes to especially retaining talent, that engagement, that culture matters as a, as, as, as a defining point that ultimately uh, your employees look at whether they, they stay or go. Um, so we really put a lot of focus on, on the engagement, on, on essentially getting to know each other even better and making sure that there was a balance between not just we're meeting to, to do work um, or you know, we're meeting via Zoom to check in, but, but maintaining the culture in a, in a more fun way at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so, um, Alex, so continuing on that thought process, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things that we as executives deal with is um, hiring versus outsourcing. Um, how do you, how do you, when you, when you look at those two very different models, right? And then there's also, also a hybrid model between that. How do you assess in this, especially in this environment, hey, am I going to continue to hire or am I just better off outsourcing or is it, is there somewhere in the middle? Yeah, that 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 became very real, and you know the way the way I approached it was in the short term. It requires a lot more of a resource commitment, so um, it's taking longer to hire. It's taking more 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 time and effort to hire, and then once you do hire, it's taking more time to train and onboard mm -hmm. as well. And so there's a bigger commitment on the front end, and then there's the you know what's the what's the return on that investment? Now you have to be confident that all that time you just invested in that team or person that they'll stick around. And if it's a more junior position, I think that becomes more difficult if if he or she is um, working remote. For the most part, that's not the type of environment that, that they're looking for. They're looking for more of a camaraderie group type of setting. And so it, it depends on the role. It depends on the department. But it raises those questions in terms of spending more time and what return do you get? And are you better off whether uh, it's a solution for the next year or several years to just outsource to get that stability? Mm -hmm. And to still get the work done without taking on that 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 risk that you're going to spend all this time and not you know not able to retain the team or have to deal with constant turnover. Uh, interesting. Um, and, and Yuan, what about on your end when you look at the two models? Um, I I, th I think in, it, this is even it's it's it's, it's a good question pre pandemic as well. Um, weighing pros and cons of uh, outsourcing versus uh, grow internally. Um, but as far as you know, uh, when a firm is small, it's inevitably you have to outsource certain functions that require uh, checks and balances, segregation of the duties. Um, I, I think our firm was in the front line of uh, promoting outsourcing model in functions like middle office, treasury, overnight trading, certain aspects of HR, legal and compliance. And that is the only way that you keep, you can keep the headcount low. Um, the decision factors are driven by one, you know, the firm, Anything you outsource, you lose flexibility. You have to set realistic expectations. Um, you can't expect vendor to turn around in the next few minutes versus you could internally <laughs> because you're not the only client they have. So setting realistic expectations and knowing what you can't give up is, is, is one of a, a, a key decision factor. And an investor demand, you know, there are certain function investors want you to outsource, especially administrator. Um, and, and, and then and there are others, investor 
don't want you outsource, such as mm-hmm. your fiduciary duty over your investors. You cannot outsource that. Right. So you have to have a, a unique talents uh, ha- who have ability to oversee the key vendor and the key functions if you do decide to outsource. And the complexi- complexity of organization is another uh, key factors about outsourcing, you know, um, even you outsource administrator, if your product is very complex. And I think reviewing administrators work will not get you to the level of a comfort. Um, instead, shadow accounting could be very necessary because the complexity and mm-hmm. obviously lastly may not be the last uh, point for consideration is the cost. How you manage uh, paying vendor versus growing uh, a team internally. Uh, so all those factors are, are very important, but outsourcing becomes uh, increasingly difficult during the remote period. Um, and, and that is something I think um, I'm not talking about um, outsourcing to big vendors. I'm talking about more of a you know, certain aspect of uh, uh, compliance work that typically being done handle in-house. Now you wanna take that to uh, a vendor. Reputation of the vendors is critical. How that vendor integrate with your internal culture um, that's critical. And the consultant is also another factor for outsourcing. That can be very tough as well. Um, they are consulting consultants, but they are, in order to make a consultant work seamlessly, you have to treat them as part of the team, how you integrate that. All right. those factors, I think, is, is critical for decision making. Um, um, as we as the industry becomes a little bit mature, you know, certain functions, everybody outsource, and that's what investors expected of. Um, mm-hmm. But there are other areas still require examination, what makes most sense for the firm. Uh, interesting. Bromit, same question to you for, for participants just joining us. We're talking about decision of hiring internally versus um, outsourcing. Um, and yes, you know, not much different than what Jan and Alex said, I guess, one perspective, one perspective that I do have is um, what's right for the business. And one of the things is eliminating single points of failure. And so when you've got single points of failure, at least in my uh, opinion, that's a good place to kind of have some kind of an outsource model. And generally, those happen to be, I would say, it, uh, you know, can be in the sort of the less sophisticated, you know, expense payments, you know, various others right. where, you know, sometimes you have one person who's got that functional knowledge being at a firm for a while. And I think one of the things that, you know, as you mentioned in the previous question, great resignation may have highlighted is people who may have left have had, you know, some core institutional knowledge and how do you kind of replicate that? So uh, one of the factors, uh, you know, I evaluate whether you use a leverage model is, you know, are there any single points of failure that it would make, would mm-hmm. be effective to outsource. And so you've got that redundancy built in and doesn't impact the business if someone were to leave. And um, and in, as in terms of, you know, what's internal, um, again, I, I think Johan said it, uh, you know, it's really about expertise and that's kind of hard to replace. And so, for example, you know, an area, you know, like valuations, I'd rather, you know, have folks on my team that kind of know that because that's not an e- easy place. So it's really uh, perhaps the in- internal uh, team is really about, you know, expertise, knowledge, you know, again, uh, investor uh, interactions, that is I think that's hard to outsource and outsourcing perhaps kind of the day-to-day activity, which is replicable and, and again, you know, necessary to keep the business moving forward and not impacted by any, you know, turnover on the finance or any other team. Um, interesting. And before I let you go, Promit, uh, on this topic, if you have to look out to an outlook, um, do you expect any major change, you know, hopefully, you know, once the endemic is here, uh, or you think where we stand right now is this is how the model is going to be um, in the immediate future. Are you talking in terms of the leverage model or? Yeah, the same, the, the outsourcing, hiring internally, um, the model will remain static. So in my experience that the model has kind of uh, been dissimilar, even, you know, some of the previous firms that I've worked at, um, mm-hmm. 
perhaps what the pandemic has highlighted is that now that you do have people perhaps moving more than they were prior, um, at least for me, having that kind of outsource and being able to leverage, uh, you know, kind of an outsource provider to help continue to maintain sort of the day-to-day um, and ease the transition of the finance team has been useful. Um, so I would say my sense is, it, at least from my experience, the that model for me has not changed that much. Perhaps for me, um, it has highlighted that uh, it's more highlighted importance in, in this you know, environment where we do have, you know, Mm-hmm. A talent shortage or, you know, folks uh, leaving to you know, join other organizations. Interesting. Uh, you want the same question to you. What's your out- immediate outlook um, heading into 2022? Um, I think a lot, I mean, clearly COVID were, how COVID being contained would dictate the timeline of the entire an- industry and how quickly uh, a trend being set, set. Currently, everyone is 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 promoting a, a hybrid model, and I'm hoping hybrid model um, uh, is a would be a way to stay uh, for the industry. I mean, we have uh, proven that the finance team can operate effectively. Uh, in a remote environment uh, without discounting the benefit of, uh, of uh, seeing each other face to face in the social life, um, but giving people that flexibility of, uh, of uh, managing their personal responsibility while being productive in meeting professional responsibility um, is, is a key. I think, I think, um going back to pre-pandemic um arrangement it's going to be difficult um especially if someone requires to commute two hours a day and plus that is just not something people would go back to in my Mm -hmm. opinions and uh um i mean at the same time human tend to forget about what happened before, right? Right now, everyone just fresh in mind, trying to understand how important giving that flexibility to people in their life and in return made them a happy uh, person, happy person doing a happy job, you know? Um, but once, I'm just hoping that we don't forget, you know, there are a lot of possibilities out there um, in, in an talent individual will require a demand flexible working arrangement and, and I think that is something that a manager needs to respect and take that into um, consideration and I think this is going to be on top candidates list which was on the list before but it's not top and I think mm-hmm. given what we have gone through especially for the finance um, individuals in and hiring, I think it become very critical because we really don't need to be in the office to be productive in, a, right. in a making a good contribution to the firm. Alex, um, same question to you on the uh, what's your outlook, immediate outlook, on, um, you know, both looking at the leverage model and, and the working environment. I. I think the key is flexibility and, and agility. I mean, these types of conversations before would happen on every five, 10, 15 years. And now it, it, it seems like things are evolving and, and changing. And um, the goal is going to be how flexible and agile can you be? Because it's not, it's not for the firm as a whole. It's not for department. It really is at the individual level now. Um, as, as you all mentioned, you know, commute is a huge factor um, and what type of in-home office setup you have is a huge factor as well. So, and that's completely at the individual level. And so listening to that at the interview process with the existing employees and, and trying to have a solution that is able to solve for, for multiple uh, cases like this, where mm-hmm. it's hybrid, it, it, it's a hybrid inside of a hybrid kind of thing and um, making sure that your office is able to handle a a hybrid environment if someone does want to come in every day 
uh, versus someone that um, doesn't want to commit at all because of the uh, the distance maybe or some sort of a hybrid where it's two to three times a day. I think we have to be flexible and, and agile to be able to, to do all of that and continue to evolve based on how the overall macro environment uh, changes. But we learn a lot from every single interview we conduct. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot more of an inquiry and kind of that anecdotal study. So we understand what, what is important to, to the people we interview. That's interesting. We, we use the word evolve. So that would be our next topic. But before we talk about the evolution of the finance office and its function, we have a quick poll, polling question here. Amy, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. The second polling question is, what is your firm's current policy on working location for its professionals? A, fully remote, B, office, C, hybrid, or D, no defined policy? And as a reminder, if you would like to uh, receive CPE credit for this session, uh, you will need to respond to at least five of the six polling questions uh, that we pull up throughout the discussion. All right, it looks like people are pretty quick on this one. So here are the results. Not surprised. Um, almost half is, are going towards hybrid environment. <clears throat> I think that's generally what we're seeing, um, the trend, and based on our discussion even today. Um, so, Yuan, uh, going back to you, um, I know we, we were preparing for this call. New York Times had just published an article. Um, it was really interesting. It says the title was The Worst of Both Worlds is Zooming from the Office. Um, the article was basically highlighting the challenges with the hybrid work environment. Um, you know, simple things is conducting video calls with a mix of both people in the office and remote workers. Um, so can you share some of your perspective on the new environment that you find ourselves since um, the start of the pandemic? Um, I, I think I think the New York article clearly uh, highlighting a new face as we open in the office. Um, I think before the new New York article about the new struggle between some workers working from office, others working remotely, how can they interact efficiently uh, without being bogged down by technologies? But during pandemic, when everyone was remote working, um, I think I mentioned that before, uh, uh, being transparent about firms' uh, goals and objectives um, are critical to the finance team. You know, I think mm -hmm. traditional view about finance team, you know, they're a hard worker, they puck their head down, they go through cycles, um, and they produce. And, 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 and I think in the remote setting, that just not good enough. You need to make sure that they, they, they know what's going on with the firm, and uh, they feel they're part of the firm. Um, so what we do is, uh, f for my team, we used to have face-to-face -face weekly meeting. Clearly, during pandemic, that replaced by live video chat uh, week weekly. Um, not just going over. Uh, deadlines, critical um, tasks that we have to complete, um, but more about what the rest of firm is doing, what they are thinking about, uh, how can we create value add proposition to help achieve um, uh, the objective. Um, technology have, them, have made the remote working uh, environment actually a lot more effective during pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Um, screen sharing, you know, I will never stop share, share screen um, in a team environment um, meetings, even is face to face. Instead of having someone hover over your shoulder, sharing screen is very effective. It's a perfect way of uh, training people and walk through your file, walk through your thought process, asking questions. Um, and another thing is a video chat across the globe. 
including your vendors. That never happened before. You know, you could have a vendor that you worked every day, never met before because they are overseas. You know, having them visit you in person just not possible. Pandemic made that happen. I have seen so many people I work with that I never met uh, during the pandemic. And another thing is, which is good for environment. People, everyone learned to be paperless during pandemic, right? <laughs> that is a good, a good thing. You know, when pre-pandemic, everyone tried to be paperless, but during pandemic, you are forced to be paperless. And then I think that's a, uh, a good thing. So I just want to think about, you know, positive things, aspects coming out of pandemic, Nick, mm-hmm. pandemic. Um, and then another thing is, uh, you know, when you're in the office, when people want to ask you cash question they can see if you're busy but during pandemic virtual environment they don't know if you're busy you know they have a question they call it real time you know mm-hmm. if it's team of four if only three people can participate chat that's fine so i feel like you know uh we definitely uh, be- become more engaging in getting to hear other people's uh, uh thoughts about issues, um, complex um, business um, arrangement in a more timely manner, uh, and then getting everyone involved, you know, not just I will go to my controller for this question, I'm actually getting everyone, um, mm-hmm. because there's intangible value of others knowing uh, the process from front to end, even though they don't have to actively participate, just being informed, being observant and being in the audience, you know, it, it, it definitely uh, create value at results. Um, so those are the thing I think, I think um, what pandemic have taught us in, in and I would like that to, to continue. And last thing I want to mention is what pandemic taught us is I think uh, Speaking in front of an audience being videoed in the beginning of the pandemic, if you remember, you don't know what to say. (laughs) (laughs) After a year and a half, you know, you learn to ignore people's facial feedback. You know, you're just free to share your idea. I think we all kind of become a little bit more uh, thicker skinned, but, you know, it's it's a positive aspect, I think, positive uh, turnout that we feel good about sharing thoughts virtually in a, as effective of uh, face-to-face. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's a, a promise. Same question to you. Uh, how has your perspective changed or not changed um, you know, after finding yourself in this environment uh, on the work, working hybrid? I would say it's probably required a lot more time focusing on people, like especially people within your team and how much like again, spending time that's kind of outside of the work focus because uh, again, it's, uh, you know, I think with the virtual work environment, you know, we've got various things, you know, Slack, T, like folks can get a hold of you pretty routinely. Um, I think initially in the early days, kind of the work day started to expand uh, significantly um, because, uh, you know, there was kind of hard to kind of have a big the middle and the end. There weren't like any natural boundaries. So I think, um, you know, couple of things that, you know, we've instituted is just more, again, that one-on-one time just to check in on people, just to make sure, see how they're doing, especially I I do have a relatively new team that are kind of learning um, and absorbing a lot. Um, And so just making sure that, you know, they're getting what they need, you know, they, um, again, a lot of that was somewhat easier when you were all working, you know, together, it was visible, you could see if somebody had questions, I think accessibility, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times people like, oh, I don't want to trouble, you know, you know, you might be busy. And so you just want to make sure you have that natural interaction and being, you know, open, um, you know, to questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I generally tell at least my team, so, I, you know, if you're sending emails at least to each other, you know, there's like a, a cutoff. And so, you know, I'll either delay my emails the next day unless there's something. So just creating, uh, you know, some kind of physical boundary in this virtual world. I mean, right. I, I think that's been helpful. Um, and then the other, again, um, with me being new to the firm and, you know, number of my team is we've started doing, um, uh, you know, uh, dedicated events with other sort of teams, uh, groups within top tier. And so, you know, we just had a, you know, a holiday dinner with our investor, you know, service investor relations team. And so uh-huh. having, you know, unique events that are not about work, but, uh, and actually having that with, you know, other folks, again, 
to continue to you know, grow and meet people. And there's also a lot of new people um, on other sides of the firm and sort of continue to build sort of that, evolve that culture. Um, and then, um, you know, as we've gone back into hybrid, uh, you know, environment, um, there's, you know, one dedicated day, we all, we all go into the office, which is mm-hmm. great. Cause again, um, you know, that, that folks I never met and, you know, now, you know, men in person and, you know, people on my team, the folks and, um, and then, uh, but again, and then there's one day we just go in as a team to work. And so we've kind of, generally isolated, put most of our meetings on those two days, just because then mm-hmm. we are all together. And so again, trying to ease the flow of, you know, I, I think again, when we started the pandemic, there was like a number of meetings that everybody was trying to figure out the rules and how do we get a hold of people. And, um, and so we've again, started to try and, you know, work our schedule in a way that's kind of work friendly and we're not mm-hmm. kind of pushing the environment you know, out beyond sort of the normal working hours because we are all stacked in all these meetings. Um, and then again, it's required a lot of, you know, just focus one-on-one time, you know, also just minding when you're sending a message, you know, just make sure it's clear. A lot of times a quick message can, you know, land poorly and just being, you know, aware yeah. that, you know, you just follow that up um, with the conversation. And then again, sort of having more kind of uh, intra-group kind of events, um, especially uh, you know, as we start going live a little bit more. Yeah, I like to resonate that. I think even us, we are, when we go back to the office, it's the days is you're going to meet someone, you're going to have lunch with, and you're going to, grab drink with someone after that. So the whole day is going to be very social. Um, Alex, um, same question to you. Uh, how, what's your perspective on this new environment, this hybrid work environment? Um, yeah, other than um, my colleagues have said, um, I think the other big point is around patience, emotional intelligence, empathy. It's it's more important now than than before to really understand what others are are going through because um, situations are are more fluid and so having that type of communication and understanding of um, what someone else may be dealing with whether it's figuring out um, child care in this new new hybrid environment or what is going on in the home or even the home setup so uh, it, it it's definitely forced a lot more uh, patience and, and empathy. And then on the hybrid, kind of what, what the article talked about is we quickly realized that when we w- went back into the office in a hybrid state, our conference rooms weren't really set up to, to handle some people calling in, um, some people being in the room and having a live presenter in the room as well. Um, so the, you find things out live where, hmm, our camera is at the back of the person presenting. That doesn't really work for those on the phone. Uh, so it's, it's little things like that that you end up uh, uh, identifying in and figuring out, okay, do I need to upgrade my technology to, to be able to handle this type of hybrid situation in the future? Interesting. I mean, you know, I, I want to stick to the point of, um, you know, our roles. You know, I think we, we're becoming chief people's officer now more. Um, so before I do that, uh, I, I want to go to our next poll, and then we'll pick that up um, after that. So, Amy, um, turning back over to you on the poll. All right. The third question is, what is your firm's top priority for its finance office heading into 2022? A, investment in new technology. B, automating finance functions. C, enhancing cybersecurity. D, retaining and attracting top talent. E, outsourcing or F, other. And then also, I would like to remind you to submit questions for the presenters using your Q&A window. Uh, we do have quite a bit of content for today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. All right, almost done on this one. Okay, here are the results. Uh, not surprising, retaining and attracting top talent. Um, you know, it's true for us. We've moved a little bit away from margins and profits and revenue forecast more. And hey, just you know, keeping our people happy. Um, you know, that's been paramount. Um, Alex, just um, staying on that theme, our role as executives in our firm. Um, you know, how has that changed for you personally? Um, 
you know, given what has happened, has that brought you more closer to your team members and just, you know, just do you see yourself more involved in terms of their well-beings? You know, not, not that we were not before, but just ha- has that evolved more over the last couple of years? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, more and more this great resignation and everything else, there's a lot more weight on happiness over compensation. So it's it's figuring out what happiness means for others in terms of you know, engagement being challenged, um, the right type of work environment. So um, it's a lot easier to do a market study and understand what your comp should be. It's a lot harder to understand what makes people happy. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, even from recruiting and the talent side of things, the outbound uh, efforts that we make, the response rate is significantly lower, at least for us. I don't know what it is um, for others because, you know, if people are happy um, in their roles, they're not willing to respond and, and take an interview because that may mean I work more hours, it's more stressful, and if I'm happy now, I'm, you know, I'm not as sensitive to, to compensation and being able to move. So I think that dynamic changed in a, in a meaningful way. And our roles beyond just figuring out comp and, and how that feds in is also figuring out what, what is making people happy. Um, so you have a much better sense of that, that formula and from, to both attract and retain. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, from a safe question to you, um, how's there, how, how do you see your role? evolving um over the last couple of years yeah i, I think i'd echo what alex said i think it really is about just gauging happiness again i, I think in, in, a, in a remote environment that you know that can be tough um and um i think and especially as people do you know we've when we've hired people are really focused in on kind of the work culture you know what what are they giving up from kind of a cultural perspective to what they're getting, you know, the compensation, you know, discussions follow and, you know, those mm-hmm. are all measured and marked, but really I think people are evaluating, um, you know, again, what are they kind of opting into and, and, you know, one of the, you know, key, which we've discussed is, you know, really about how, you know, how flexible, you know, will you be what, you know, what people's management styles are, you know, just what's the work environment like, you know, there's just a lot in there that, um, uh, you know, folks are kind of vetting much more thoroughly, um, you know, asking to meet with perhaps more senior members, you know, of, of the firm, just to understand kind of the broader culture. And so I think the, you know, as we've been hiring one of the, uh, what I've noticed is the due diligence is definitely, uh, you know, a lot more, you know, in, in that, um, you know, in, in that vein. And so, I mean, again, and, and also in retaining talent is how do you continue to keep you know, folks engaged and, right. and happy? And like I said, you know, one of the programs, you know, we, you know, we came up with is, you know, giving folks, you know, kind of dollar allotment to kind of explore, you know, passions outside of work and then bring it in and share it and starting to create, um, you know, conversations again that are not just, you know, uniquely about work and exploring kind of the broader work, which I, I think was perhaps less prevalent, you know, pre-pandemic. Interesting. Um, Yuan, uh, same question. Your role, how has that changed over the last two years or has evolved? I, I think uh, compensation is important is mm-hmm. is is cap- compensation may not buy you happiness but compensation validates your achievement especially mm-hmm. for individual at the middle m- middle level uh giving the inflation rate being so high uh getting paid rewarded in a fair way help you manage your financial obligations, especially in Bay Area. And I think CFO and a CEO's job to educate your PM on value added projects that your team brings to the table. Mm-hmm. We're not just traditional finance team. We we focus on value proposition that generates operations alpha such as tax planning Mm -hmm. and uh, integrating technology uh, to -to day-to-day responsibility that minimize operations risks and 
and they need to recognize that. And, and then more importantly, it's, it's good to benchmark your finance team to statistics survey. But at the same time, it's our job to educate our PNs that you need uniqueness of individual on your team in terms of skill set that adds value to the contribution of the firm. It, it, it needs to be highlighted. And I don't think a lot of PMs have a clue of uh, um, how important um, one individual on the team member is. You know, it's, they are, yeah, everyone can be replaced, but if truly replacing institutional knowledge and unique skill set, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it costs money for the firm. And another type of happiness, I think, for the finance team is uh, um, have the ability of uh, balance personal responsibility and a professional uh, advancement. And, and I, I think we have touched on the topic is uh, respecting boundary, um, even in the hybrid model and uh, reduce costs during off hours and checking in with your team on their wellness on mm -hmm. regular basis that become part of uh, our job. No, that's interesting. I think that was my next question is just, you know, just how, how, how do we show appreciation to, to what I think is a very critical function. Finance is a critical function of, of an investment mm -hmm. fund. Um, so it's interesting that you highlighted those topics. Um, uh, yeah, speaking of that, I think we have a poll uh, following this topic. And Amy, I'll turn it that back, turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. So this one is um, how much you agree with this statement. Uh, video calls and conferencing will replace in-person meetings for the most part going forward. A, strongly agree. B, somewhat agree. C, maybe. D, disagree. Or E, strongly disagree. And this is our fourth uh, polling question out of six for this first session here. We'll give it five more seconds. Okay, here are the results. Um, interesting. A mixed bag, but more on the agree side. Yuan, Alex, Roman, I don't know if you have any comments on this on this particular question. Um, I, I I think it's I think it's more leaning to somewhat agree for me personally. But uh, just, just curious if you have any take on this. Although I personally like personal you know interaction. Um, okay. Um, okay. Moving forward. Technology, speaking a good segue. Um, you while uh, you know, continuing with you, I, I know you talked about you know things. Even things like they were always there, like screen sharing technology. Uh, we had Microsoft Teams, and we, you know, you know, we never even explored those because you're right. I mean, you know, when you and I worked, we would like just look at shared screen and just like, oh, look at this cell, just look at this number. Now I'm thinking, oh, that that exercise would have been a lot easier if we just had both our screens on and we were just, you know, looking at the same data and just had a video, didn't need to be doing that. So just, yeah, just if you have any comments as to the last couple of years, has, has that really increased the need for technology, innovation, kind of kept the same, or are we just discovering a lot of technologies were all already there and are we using it more effectively? Yeah, I think the latter. I mean, obviously technology enhanced during pandemic, um, as you mentioned, some of the technology that is available to us, we never really thought about integrating to our day-to-day -day, uh, workflow. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, those type of technology are not expensive at all. You know, um, having in, making investment in a good headset, uh, a good cam, um, webcam, um, and then um, I, I think one another thing is is internet speed, right? Because that is crucial. Um, um, 
that really interfere, could potentially interfere with our day-to-day -day, uh, workflow if internet speed doesn't support um, the file size. You know, I think that is something I think there's still a room for improvement. Um, and I think it's important for the firm partner with the right um, vendor to support the aspects. You know, as we become more reliant on technology, security, it's, uh, training your people uh, not to do and have a good best practices, recognizing um, bad links, not click on it, and that becomes increasingly important. Mm -hmm. um, now, our cell phone almost partially become a firm property. You know, they put all the securities on the phone, so you're not able to copy and paste into your personal email, and it's at the demand of investors. You know, all those mm. things was was not uh, on the top of the priorities. Now it is. Um, and then, uh, luckily, we don't really rely on uh, paper files anymore, but if you do have to print out some paper, making sure that, you know, it gets shredded or put it away, not laying around everywhere in the office, you know, depending on your roles and, and, and responsibility, we just become more mindful, you know, yes, technology help us become efficient, but we want to make sure that uh, certain rules and responsibility are placed using technology. Interesting. Uh, from the same, same question to you on technology innovation. Yeah, I mean, definitely, again, uh, you know, it's, this has naturally led us to a focus on technology. I guess the the, the one aspect that uh, I think has become perhaps more in focus is around cybersecurity. And now with all of us working remotely, you know, I, I know if other folks have, but, you know, Jeff, you know, phishing and a lot of these. And so one of the, I think, at, at least challenges for me and my team is, um, you know, making sure, you know, just, uh, you know, we're, wires and all of that. So I'd say while there's been kind of somewhat ease of doing business, uh, there's also now, you know, we, we're also very used to, you know, technology and, you know, things coming through email or, um, and so some of, you know, some of that is, I, I guess, one aspect that, you know, we're, we're more focused on now is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you avoid and, and at least for us, we've seen like a, a more increase in that, um, again, just over my, you know, my career doing this more increase there because I think pe people are taking more advantage. So, you know, that's been one, you know, at least for us, one outshoot of this that we, um, but we, but, but again, we, you know, I think we, we have offices that are, you know, not cold. So I, we will always be kind of in a hybrid technology model because we're always beaming in people from, from other offices. So I, I think technology will be, um, will be with us, but that's, you know, just another aspect that, you know, we've, we've seen is just around, you know, cybersecurity and just making sure that, uh, you know, technology is, uh, you know, it's not being used for, you know, uh, making, you know, for some kind of, you know, illegal or making us do something that, um, you know, is, is not fiduciary. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting. Alex, same question to you on technology. And, and also, Alex, we're going to talk about automation and, and, and if you guys are thinking about doing any, you know, tasks that are manual and automating them. Um but just, yeah, it was your overall view and how technology has played a role in the last couple of years in, in your role as a, as a CEO. Yeah, I think it, it probably accelerated some of the things that were more aspirational. It maybe uh, accelerated those timelines a little bit, um, whether it's trying to automate more, trying to, to connect more systems, trying to, and, you know, bring more of the data and information forward. So it's mm -hmm. not limited to maybe one person, but um, you know, access to a broader team on, on getting access to certain data or, or analysis that's coming out of the, the, the back office. So um, I think that's been a positive, just like with everything else, there's a balance, uh, you know, being in the Bay Area, the amount of startups and the amount of ads to, that promise to make things more, more efficient and save time here and save time there. Um, everything's a balance. You know, do, do you really need this? Will it really make things better? Um, can you really, you know, implement the change management? And if you, you know, change too much too quickly, what kind of disruption does that uh, do? So um, I think balance with technology and timing is, is important as well, that it's not, um, it's not disruptive. 
Interesting. Um, I think it's echoing generally what we're seeing um, in the industry across across the industries. Um, thank you for that thought. Uh, that will lead us into our next fifth polling question, Amy. I'll turn it back over to you again. All right. Thank you, Syed. So the fifth question is: What is your firm's top strategic priority heading into 2022? A. Asset growth. B. Investment performance. C. New product offering. D. Expense management. Or E. Other. All right, it looks like most have had a chance to respond. So here are the results. Interesting, asset growth and investment performance, which I believe usually stays true uh, in any year. Uh, Promet, um, that's actually our topic discussion here. Uh, can you discuss some of the strategic priorities for top tier? Um, heading into 2022? Uh, I think the one, at least for us, which I think we've been talking about is, I mean, it's really talent management and people. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of, a lot of our IP rests in, um, you know, who we have on the top tier team. And I would say, you know, obviously, you know, know, asset growth, performance, all of that matters, but there's, um, you know, especially we, we are a growing team. And so, you know, retaining, attracting top talent. I mean, that is a, you know, a key area of focus, as well, especially as we, you know, build forward. Um, mm-hmm. And also just finding out, you know, is evaluating what are the skill sets that exist on the top tier team and, you know, where, you know, where we may need to augment it. And so, you know, especially now around data and some of those. And so we're looking at exploring just to make sure we you know we have a, uh, you know, retaining, attracting talent, but then also, you know, adding to ways that are actually, you know, obviously support the growth of the firm and support investment performance. But I would say, you know, uh, talent is is a key strategic priority going into um, into next year. Interesting. And, and probably one more question I wanted to ask about ESG. You know, it's been around for uh, was the last three three years, but it's still continue to be a very hot topic. Um, are you getting more of a demands or questions from your investors to talk about ESG or at least put them in the investment mandate in any form. Um, I'm just curious to know. Yeah, we are. I mean, we're definitely seeing more conversations, um, you know, around ESG. Uh, um, and I think we're also seeing just in the venture, there's just a lot of, you know, funds that are also being, you know, set up mm-hmm. climate tech and various others. I would say, um, uh, at least from my experience, it's, it, it's kind of a, it's a growing conversation. I don't know if it's, uh, um, and I know now there's also, uh, you know, I think the SEC is paying attention to it and, you know, putting parameters a- around how do you define ESG. I do see this as evolving more in the years, but I would say it's um, it's definitely, you know, it's sort of rising, you know, to the, you know, to, uh, there's definitely more interest. Um, you know, there's definitely more reporting around, you know, ESG efforts, you know, that, that we now have to do. Um, and so, you know, that, that's been our experience with ESG. Yeah, interesting. Um, you want the same question to you. BFM's strategic priorities um, heading into 2022. Yeah, um, 2021 has been a, a tough year for long short equity manager in healthcare space. Mm-hmm. Uh, some top managers uh, return down 30-40% uh, when they had a fantastic year the year before. Um, we have demonstrated to the investor our uh, risk management in a tough environment. Hopefully that paved a good roadmap for asset raising, uh, growing the firm uh, in 2022. On top of that, you know, we launched our first private equity fund Mm -hmm. um, during pandemic and uh, we almost closed uh, from the first fund. We're hoping to launch fund two. Um, it has become a little bit trendy to see hedge fund manager gain to private equity VC space. Um, um, and and to my team, I think it's great 
uh, combination of the skill set, if you could do both, uh, just make us more marketable. Um, I think 2022 definitely is a year of uh, getting the performance back on track, uh, continue to demonstrate investor that how hedge fund can diversify their investment profile at the same time, offer them um, uh, a product like private equity fund um, that um, secure long-term capital and having better, greater returns. Yeah, uh, you and speaking of that, I know you and I were speaking about the evolution of hedge funds in, in exploring new products. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a trend just in uh, with your fund or in healthcare hedge funds, or is that the trend? Yeah, and I've seen that developing in the last few years. Do you think that will continue to accelerate um, just going forward? Yeah, especially for manager who have been handling private through their side pockets in the hedge mm-hmm. fund product. It's natural progression that, hey, they want a commitment of the capital, especially when they have a huge allocation or lead a deal with a, a company that that allow them to participate. You know, side pocket only get you so far in terms of size of the positions. Um, private equity and, and the capital commitment structure definitely provide you uh, certainties when opportunity come across. Right. Interesting. Um, uh, Alex, turning back over to you, uh, some of the strategic priorities for Munich RV Ventures going forward 2022. Yep. So Munich RV Ventures just raised a, a new fund as well this year that um, almost doubled the size of the platform. So um, similar to what Promet said, very much in, in hiring mode. Um, the team is expected to grow by more than 50%. So um, talent acquisition, talent retention is, is very much at the, at the top of the list to be able to, to execute on the, on the new size of the platform. Um, and, you know, outside of continued investment performance, it's, uh, it's, it's really navigating the, the new world of VC as well. Uh, so much what Yuan mentioned, there's, you know, more, more capital, more dry powder in the, in the ecosystem than there ever was before. And so, um, that the valuations, it's a, it's an interesting world to, to navigate for, for the purely VC funds. So, um, that, and then, yeah, just getting into new areas, new scope, new sectors as, as part of the new fund as well. Interesting. Um, Yuan, I, I have a question that just came through, uh, just directed towards you. Uh, where, where are you in your distress and opportunistic investment arena? You want this question is addressed to you. Yeah, we we have not done much in terms of a distressed. Um, we used to do distressed debt, but we haven't done much. Just the opportunity is not there for healthcare space. But opportunist um, investor arena, we definitely um, have done a lot. Um, especially in the healthcare space. Um, there are tons of uh, uh, private companies um, moving towards uh, a future uh, in terms of their technology, you know, such as robotic um, surgeries and uh, um, cancer agent um, solutions. Um, and they need a funding, um, and uh, uh, we make sure that we provide uh, funding sources in various different type of funds through hedge fund, through private equity fund, through um, also um, um, co-investment product uh, to offer um, that opportunity to help the society grow. I think that's where the future takes us, and and then once we recognize. Um, uh, a potential uh, a private company, we provide funds and hopefully um, returns for the investors. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, Yuan, while I have you on the call um, on this topic, uh, expense management, uh, has, you know, I do want to talk about mm-hmm. that really quickly. Mm-hmm. It's just all this a, a topic discussion. Has that changed um, if from your, especially from your investors, as you've been raising new funds, uh, what, what is their view on, on just management mm-hmm. fees? Uh, what type of expenses funds can you know take on? Um, just, just I know 
it's been in the news last week or so, a couple of weeks. There's been some news about it. Just a quick comment on um, expenses and the ratios. And... Yeah, expense allocation becomes very tricky. It's when you have uh, um, uh, numerous different um, type of products that potentially can come across research related, which through soft dollar, if you hedge funds, mm -hmm. And the hard dollar can be paid by the funds, can be paid by management company. Within hard dollar, you have a different type of funds. Right now, you got PE funds, you got hedge funds, hedge fund with side pocket. How are you going to allocate equitably uh, that will not cause any um, conflict of interest by SEC in case you being examined? One tool that we have been uh, implementing, actually implemented pre-pandemic, as we recognize the complexity of uh, expense allocation uh, become, becoming more increasing is a tool called Integrate Data. Integrate Data, I think, um, is an application uh, owned by ACA, I believe. Uh, we really helped them evolve. Um, the tool doesn't make our life easier, but the tool does uh, retain um, a record of uh, approval, allocation methodology, storage of invoices. Um, it's all in one platform um, that require every individual follow the process. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting the invoice allocated approved takes many people. Uh, it, it lengthens the process, but but the payout is uh, is when you get audited. I mean, we all get audited by our auditors on an annual basis, and there's a record of it, and mm -hmm. especially being remote, it's all on the tool. You can uh, give auditor access. You can pull all the sign off, all the audit tra trail and invoice straight from the tool. Um, and you can run reports. Um, and then more important, when SEC audits you, there are documentation of the thought process. Because as, as, as expenses become more complex, so often you don't even even remember why you allocated this way five years down the road if you get examined. But having that documentation, have that discipline um, becomes very important. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Prom, same question to you on expense um, allocation among the funds and, and the investor demands. Yeah, and again, you answered, well, I mean, that's, you know, the same. I think all of us kind of just make wrestle with the same, just make sure allocations, you know, record keeping, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, and then how, you know, again, allocating, especially when you're in a fundraise environment and you're raising perhaps multiple funds, just make sure, um, you know, how is it allocated? So uh, again, I'd echo everything you on said. I mean, the, um, I think there's one thing that got simpler during COVID was that there was less travel. And so I would say right. the right. overall, I'd say, um, the level of expense has definitely declined. So that, that would give, you know, breathing space. And then the other interesting thing is, you know, how much, how much travel will exist, you know, going forward. And, you know, just again, given that people have raised funds in this remote environment. And so, um, you know, and again, I think just even around, um, you know, do you have uh, investor meetings in person? Do you do it virtually? How often do you do it? So I think the mm -hmm. interesting, uh, you know, looking forward is how much of it uh, from a, fundraising and uh, investor uh, perspective, does it go to a bit more remote and virtual versus, you know, I think obviously pre-pandemic there was, um, you know, fundraising, I think required or had just a lot more, you know, people visiting um, your investors. Right. And, right. And that'll be interesting to see you know, as we move forward. Interesting. Alex, same question to you. I know you just mentioned you raised a new platform, a pretty significant one. Um, what, what were what were your discussions with investors on expenses and um, just any any thoughts in that area? On the on the allocation side, it's a little simpler for us. We're still a single LP right now with uh, with with Munich Re, um, and on just the the general nature of expenses, it echo a lot of what Pramit and um, Swan said. Uh, it's it's the uncertainty of it in the future years. So um, I think it becomes harder to look at that management fee across um, across the fund and try to predict what, what the next several years will look like and um, uh, in, in between the fundraising times where you get a new fund to potentially supplement. So whether it's uh, whether it's an increase in in just comp or, or, or inflation or things like that, the the variability of it becomes more difficult. 
Interesting. Um, well, thank you for those thoughts. I, I think that's going to lead us into our polling question six. That'd be the last polling question for this session. Uh, Amy, we'll turn it back over to you again. All right. Yes. So the last question for this session is which topic will headline in 2022? A, climate change, uh, B, blockchain and digital assets, C, space exploration, uh, D, metaverse, E, inflation and monetary policy, or F, other? All right, a few more seconds until we close this one out. Okay, here are the results. Inflation. Um, not surprising here. Uh, it, it, I was speaking with a couple of hedge fund managers yesterday, and um, that was definitely something they were on top of their mind, too. So, Alex, um, I always ask all my speakers before I let them go their outlooks. Um, so before we do talk about that, um, do you want to want to comment on how inflation is going to play a role going forward into next year? Is it just overblown, or is is the Fed going to be a little bit more uh, restrained in how they react? Um, I'm not going to try to make any any predictions on on that front. Um, I definitely think it'll have an, an impact whichever whichever way it goes I mean especially if, if it goes up I think some of the talks of hyperinflation um, hopefully we're nowhere near the definition of hyperinflation because um, that uh, yeah but you know it's an interesting dynamic for us as we as we look at the the venture capital environment the amount of funding um, that is there and that is being raised um, and then what that will mean from a capital efficiency standpoint for those startups and then ultimately what that will mean in terms of the public markets and how all that will you know how that cycle will play in an inflationary kind of environment whether the the dry powder and the funding will still be there to keep up or whether capital efficiency will come into play in terms of what these these uh these privately funded startups these vc-backed startups are able to do um, as they as they scale and how expensive it'll get for them to do that and um, and and all the other price pressures on the market side as well from a pricing standpoint. Interesting uh, and, and same uh, kind of like line of thought, Alex. Uh, deal flow. I was asking. Uh, you know, I had a, a session with a couple of general partners, and you know, that's something on their mind. You know, we had quite a bit of dollars chasing quite a few deals, um, and that's obviously created a little bit some might call it bubble um do you expect strength to continue to expect all this dry powder that has been accumulated over the last i don't know well, quite a few years is it continue uh will chasing will continue to chase the same level of deals uh or do you expect that to shift uh as we head into 2022 and beyond it, it looks like, I mean, the, the indicator is, is fundraising. So, yes, the funds are being deployed, but new funds are being raised as well. So um, that, that indicator is at least pointing to we're, we're nowhere near slowing down. Um, and so there's still there's, there's a lot of dry powder and a lot more coming on. Uh, coming on. <laughs> Interesting. So that's good. That's good for us. It's not slowing down. Uh, Promet, uh, turning back over to you on concluding thoughts, um, your outlook. Uh, I know you guys have raised quite a few funds uh, over the last few years. What, what is generally your outlook, um, economic and, and just more industry specific, as, as it relates to venture capital? Yeah, my, my only point, I think, on, on the inflation, I think you all mentioned it previously. I think, uh, you know, as you're hiring to I, talent, like folks are hearing that and how does that kind of percolate, you know, to like salaries and wages as we move forward. That'll be interesting. I even know just hiring for my team, you know, hiring somebody in February versus hiring somebody in November, uh -huh. you know, there is a difference just even in their, um, you know, base compensation. So I think from a more immediate aspect, that conversation around inflation is having, I would say, at least a tangible impact on how people, you know, 
people are listening to it and whether they're fully evaluating it or, you know, what's the true nature, but they're definitely factoring it into their, you know, compensation and other, you know, kind of lifestyle uh, decisions. Um, I would say the one uh, place where uh, there'll be more for us, especially in the venture space, is just around sort of custody and training of uh, trading of these digital assets and mm-hmm. how does that evolve? Um, you know, there's definitely a lot more, um, you know, uh, folks investing in these tokens, and if if you get a distribution of these tokens, how do you kind of transact on those? So I could see you know that being you know sort of being more emerging, um, you know, as we go for, you know go forward and, and definitely more conversations uh, there. So you know, those are a couple of things from our perspective. Uh, interesting. And, and from before I let you go again, um, any from a venture perspective, what is big the next big thing? <laughs> I know it's a lot of uh, questions. I know with blockchain <laughs> and. Yeah. If, if I if I knew that I probably uh, would be on a, uh, you know uh, would be on the investment side. But again, I think just echoing what Alex said, there's definitely a lot of fundraising. There's a lot of the I know there's you know just a lot of um, activity. I do see I think a lot more international activity. Uh, you know, I, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know obviously uh, India is a place that I watch, and I just know there've been a lot of funds raised there. There've been a lot of more IPOs. So I, I do see kind of that venture. Uh, access, you know, spreading, you know, there's been a lot more talk about Europe recently, you know, a lot of talk more about Asia kind of beyond like Israel in the past. So I kind of see it perhaps spreading more widely and, you know, back to the question of maybe there is going to be uh, people who are probably on the ground there perhaps and more access to, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some, some of the ideas that are coming up, you know, outside the U S and similarly, you know, we've expanded for, you know, we just launched our, uh, European fund last right. year, and so we're kind of following that model. But I, I could see us, you know, I think it's pretty deep here, but perhaps getting, you know, wider across the globe. Um, Thank you, Pramit. Uh, you're on concluding thoughts uh, on this topic and just overall um, uh, on the economic outlook, outlook for your industry, outlook for hedge funds, NPE now for you guys. I, I, I think in... I mean, I think just one more iteration of inflation. Really, I think as uh, as we have to think about um, how inflation uh, impacting our people, um, especially you know last Social Security uh, inflation rate for 2022 is about six percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's huge. Versus, I think San Francisco is about a little over three point eight percent. Um, as a manager, we have to acknowledge that things are getting more expensive, uh, impacting your team's day-to-day um, obligations, you know, what you can do to help out, uh, whether it is a shift of a bonuses to base to compensate that, give some sort of guarantee or else. And, and, and I think that also, I think, acknowledging reality is a way of uh, retaining talents, um, despite a lot of it, um, non-monetary rewards are equally important. But when mm-hmm. reality hits, in the, we just have to acknowledge that. And then um, on another level, I think it's that it's more about uh, taxes. You know, um, from yesterday, day one um, sessions, um, the 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 salt cap uh, work around. And I just feel like every year, you know, especially there's a, a election time, um, we manage our uh, management company business uh, based on what type of uh, uh, potential implication to partners um, in terms in terms of their um, compensation, how they are being taxed. Um, I remember that for 20, 2017 when, when Trump try to uh, increase holding period of uh, carrying interest from one year to three years. There were a whole bunch of, you know, everyone scrambling, trying to create optionality uh, when the rule is unclear. And I feel like this year we're in the same boat uh, about salt cap, whether it's going to be in repeal or whether or not it's being modified that have an implication on management company structure. So I feel like the management company starts to become increasing complex to get around the tax rule, and that's the reality. It is a lot of economics on the on the table um, that we are talking about, um, and I think it becomes a role of a CFO and a CLO is really being in tune with uh, uh, tax development 
and uh, create a solutions that's benefiting the GP. Thank you, Anada. Thanks as always. I wanted to stay away from, <laughs> we talked about quite a bit of it yesterday. So uh, no, thank you for bringing <laughs> that up. Um, well, with that, I think we conclude, we, we're going to conclude this session. Uh, again, you want thank you so much, Promit. Again, thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. I know we, uh, you guys spent quite a bit of time preparing and um, I appreciate you coming and then sharing your perspective. Uh, hopefully everyone found that insightful. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I think we will conclude this session, uh, I believe right on time. And we have a five minute break. So please don't exit your consoles. Um, and uh, we'll take a break and we'll be right back with an accounting and regulatory update with Ryan Koch and Jared. So uh, I'll turn my cameras off, and but I'll be here. So five minute break. Thank you guys. Bye.
Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, hopefully you found this first session insightful uh, and feeling fresh now for that five minute break. Okay, now I will turn it over to Ryan and Jared to lead us into our next topic on accounting and regulatory update. Um, Ryan, Jared, please take it away. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everybody. Oh, go ahead, Jared. You're starting off. Okay. So, uh, yes, this is uh, the session about the accounting and regulatory updates. Uh, presenting today are Ryan Koch and I. Ryan Koch is a partner in our Silicon Valley office working in the asset manager broker dealer space. And I am also a senior manager um, helping out in our Silicon Valley and also SoCal practices. So with that being said, like every presentation, we'll start off with the learning objectives. So for today's session, it should be somewhat quick, but today we're going to be talking about the FASB relevant updates for 2021. Really, as we go through the slides, you'll kind of notice there really isn't a lot, but it doesn't mean that the environment isn't kind of hot or asking for more updates, you know, especially with the SPAC and crypto transactions we're seeing. I can imagine that more updates will be coming in 2022, or I'm sure we're all hoping for some. Uh, additionally, we're going to be talking about some Cayman Island private fund law lessons learned. We went through the filing requirements in 2021 and really just kind of taking a, a review of what happened this year and, and looking forward. Uh, next, we're going to talk about relevant areas of discussion from the AICPA expert panel and SEC. And then lastly, talk about some key SPAC accounting technical issues for 2021. So jumping right in, I believe we're starting with our first poll question. So Amy, can you launch this for us? Yes. All right. So the first polling question for this session is what is your fund's most common discount treatment for restricted sale provisions? A, no discount. B, flat percentage. C, value of a protective put option on the security. D, other. Or E, not applicable. And as a reminder, Jared, what are you I want to repeat. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I was just, just going to comment on this a little bit. On to at least two of the three polling questions in this session for CPE. But go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, no, it's it's no problem. I think we're almost out of, well, we've got about 66% in so far. Get, we got 40 more people to go. Uh, I usually see a flat percentage uh, generally as, as an approach here. I think it's not we're not trying to get super technical about it, which is probably the answer number C is, is what, what our valuation guys suggest or would like to see, or at least gauge the flat percentages against. Uh, but the, the flat percentage is usually what we see at this point, and it ends up being generally fine uh, when it comes down to it. So uh, Jared, take it away. Yeah, I mean, I think I generally see a mix of A and B as well, but looking at the results, they are quite spread, right? We have 15% in the no discount. We have 20% at the flat. Um, it looks like about 10% at using a put option and then about 60% or six, like 55% of everyone else is doing other, something else or not applicable. Um, so really, I'm actually kind of happy to see those because that brings us to the first kind of um, ASU or the talking about the FASB exposure draft that was issued in September 15th, 2021. And with that exposure draft, just kind of they, they issued it in September and they asked for comments that were due on November 14th, 2021. So anyone who had comments, Terry, I hope you sent it in. Um, but really the objective of this exposure draft is really just to reduce the diversity in practice. And kind of as you can see with the polling results, there is some diversity in practice. And really what we're talking about here are um, the discounts around the fair value of equity securities, specifically the ones that are subject to con uh, contractual sales restrictions. Um, mainly where we see this is things like public stock lockups, where you know the, a company goes IPO and they'll be in a lockup state for a certain period of time. And therefore, the guidance kind of directed you into assessing a need for a discount. Well, with this amendment and this exposure draft out there, the proposed amendment is really clarifying that this contractual restriction is not really considered a part of the unit of account and there uh, of the equity security. And so really, you know, boiling it down, it's, it's not considered in measuring the fair value. So for all of us and everyone who used to do these assessments, it becomes a little more simplified and consistent amongst all of us, um, which is nice. 
Now, in terms of the implementation of this, there is a few things to consider. Now, specifically for non-investment companies, there really is a prospective treatment of this where the, value, the valuation adjustments will be recorded in earnings on the date of adoption. Whereas for investment companies, the guidance really wouldn't, would only apply to new restrictions on the sale on any sales that were executed after the ASU is adopted. And so really any prior accounting policies that you had on those prior restrictions will still continue and you'll keep applying them. But going forward on new restrictions is where you can apply some of this guidance once it's adopted. But right now, as I mentioned, it's kind of in the exposure draft commentary stage. Yeah, I think that the comment period is closed, which yeah. is not which is good. It closed last month. So this should, assuming that nobody dissented too heavily and there's not a huge discussion going on, which I can't imagine there would be, uh, this will be issued relatively soon. When will it be able to be adopted? We have a couple of clients that have already asked us, can we adopt this in 2021? Probably not. Um, it doesn't seem like it at this point. Uh, but I think I would keep my eyes on this for a very early 2022 ASU. Again, that's just my opinion. I don't have any inside info on that, but it just does seem like getting this out and, and available for early adoption by the end of this year seems uh, rem little chances of that happening seem remote. Great. So hopefully next year. All right. Hopefully. All right, moving along. So this one, so this this was another ASU that was issued in, in 2021. This one actually is effective now. And well, it's there is some early adoption uh, provisions that you can take on if this if applies to you. I did want to just highlight this because it does, there's not a lot of ASUs that have, in fact, there are zero ASUs that have directly to do with investment company accounting um, as we were reviewing the 2021 ASUs that were out there. Um, this one is tangentially avail uh, 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 relevant. And in some cases, I think it can be uh, directly relevant if, you, if your fund or firm is issuing any sort of equity-based share or equity class uh, share-based awards like stock options. And this goes for non uh, for non employees and employees, and it may give you some. And historically, this sort of guidance has been used to value, uh, you know, uh, securities like private options and private warrants and that sort of thing in the past. Uh, so this may give us some clues as to as to some of the codification of how uh, these may be valued going forward. Uh, so the the stick here though is that. Uh, this is this goes for only private entities. So if you're a public entity, which I, I doubt there's a lot of those on the phone right now, but those the, if they are, this is not for you. This is one of the private company, uh, private company only uh, kind of streamlining of of, of public company gap, uh, so that basically giving relief to private companies, um, and the relief comes because uh, to value a a uh, an option or a warrant uh, of a private company is extremely difficult, uh, as you probably well know. And that's just just valuing the stock is difficult. Even valuing a warrant or a time, another time-based award is even harder. Um, and the FASB has recognized that the hardest part of this is figuring out what the current price of the underlying share is. Uh, so what they've done here is. Uh, to basically streamline it is made the accounting or, or the determination of that underlying share price consistent with what you would do to determine the fair value of that share for uh, IRS purposes. So anything that you're doing for the IRS purposes for Section 409A is now going to be okay under GAAP as well. Now, what does this mean practically? Not a ton. Usually, this was kind of the, the, the same uh, approach, and they actually even conceded to this, was that this is the approach that most private companies and private entities were using to value these share-based awards anyway and determine the current price of the share, uh, taking your form, your most recent 409A and applying that as your current share price. Uh, this basically codifies that into the, the new, into the, the, ASC, the accounting standards codification officially, basically 
uh, making what was the private company practical application, or make, making what was the practice now the actual codification as well. So uh, I don't want to say it's much ado about nothing, but it definitely is a, uh, a uh, quality of life improvement here in terms of how to value these share-based awards. So uh, we'll kind of, we'll move on from that one. Um, so these are some other accounting updates. These, none of these are official, none of these are authoritative, but this is kind of the, the, the well, one of them is, but for the most part, this is what the, uh, this is what the SEC and the investment company experts panel, which is part of the AICPA, uh, uh, have been talking about over the last 12 months. Uh, so the first one is pretty niche. Uh, basically talking about how you would determine the cost if you've received stock uh, in a spinoff. And uh, what they basically have, they, they, uh, the uh, expert panel conceded that there would be some book tax differences uh, most likely related to how you would determine the cost of uh, securities received in a spinoff and what they have suggested is that anything that you would, if you were received uh, stock in a spinoff, that the way you determine that uh, cost for tax would also be consistent with how you could do it for GAAP. Uh, especially because, and they, all, they even mentioned materiality in their, in their discussion, saying that most of the time the difference would be immaterial, so it wouldn't be really needed to uh, be considered. But if you, if these, if the gap treatment and tax treatment are going to be a little bit different or a lot different, that would be considered, we would have to consider materiality there. Uh, but for the most part, they've acknowledged that tax treatment is probably fine in this cost allocation. Uh, Jared, you want to talk about some SPAC pipe commitments? Yep. So as we're seeing more and more of these SPAC transactions, there is discussions about how do we actually present these SPAC pipe commitments on the balance sheet? And really the, the question is definitely a presentation question, really gross versus net. And so just talking about pipe commitments, just a reminder, pipe commitments are the commitment by an investment company to buy shares in a merger talk, uh, target through a SPAC. And really the accounting issue comes down to how do we show that and present both the asset and also the potential liability on the balance sheet. And I think the discussions are really pointing to the fact that generally these assets should be prevented or presented on a net fair value basis on the balance sheet. And really the only time you would consider presenting it on a gross basis is appropriate when the fund has the actual obligation to make the payment. And typically there is some lag time between the actual approval by of the merger by the shareholders to the actual funding of the commitment itself. And so if you are in that period, that's where you may consider a gross presentation, but Generally, for most other times, it should be a net fair value presentation. Ryan, go ahead and go, uh, EU yeah. tax. Yeah, so this one was, this one's again, very niche, but for the most part, and this was something about how to account for this specifically. I think we have to give a little background on withholding treatment. Uh, foreign, with, foreign tax withholding treatment for investment funds is pretty dense and complicated, but for the most part, you should be applying uh, the ASC 740 guidance for income taxes when it comes to withholding treatments, meaning that a uh, when, when you're withheld, withholding. So if you're going to be withheld on capital gains, then some of your unrealized gains should be reserved for tax. Um, what, they, what this addresses, and then ba basically looking at tax provision accounting for any sort of uh, foreign income tax withholding. This is looking at the reverse of that, where you have paid, where, where taxes have been withheld in the EU and uh, you're going back, the, the fund is going back and actually reclaiming some of those taxes for whatever reason. Uh, most, most common, this would be double taxation issues. Uh, so you're going back and you're trying to reclaim some of these taxes. Those, uh, there is no, what the, the, the expert panel said is that they're really not recommending any specific disclosure or new accounting guidance for this sort of thing, but this should be considered consi considered under ASC 740, again, that income tax accounting uh, ASC, and that would mean that these receivables, uh, if, if they're you know probably recorded, they should be 
accounted for as uh, you know uh, a income tax refundable, and then uh, hit your income tax provision side on the on the income statement accordingly. Um, so that's kind of just the long and short of it. No new news here, but but if you're doing that, just consider your income tax accounting. All right. And so for the new rule 2A under the Investment Company Act, this new rule is not applicable to non-registered investment companies. The SEC uh, voted, I think, in December 2020 to adopt a new rule providing a framework for fund valuations. Specifically, um, some of these changes allow the boards to actually um, designate certain parties to perform fair value determinations on behalf of the fund. These types of um, parties can include fund investment advisors, along with maybe an, an officer of the fund. Along with this new rule, 2A5, um, also comes the adoption of rule 31A-4, which is specific around record keeping. These two rules are all specific around you know, the fair value determinations, um, but specifically 31A-4 is specific to requiring funds or their advisors to actually maintain sufficient documentation to support the fair value determinations. I'm sure these aren't big changes in terms of the industry or specifically like holding the, the documentation, but it's probably formalizing it more to making sure that it is now a, a formal requirement. Yeah, and then right, and the right takeaway right for private, the take, takeaway for private funds there is this sets forth the best practice and it's a publicly available best practice for private funds um, to go in. and so if you're curious, uh, we can point you in the right direction here if you want to be able to find these. But a quick Google search away, you can probably find these uh, new valuation and record keeping rules that uh, might give you some good ideas uh, to of how of basically practices that you can put in place at your private funds uh, that would be good and consistent with the SEC expects from private publics. Um, the last thing that they've been talking about, and they've talked about it not enough in my opinion, but is cryptocurrency in some certain areas and uh, some certain specific areas around cryptocurrency and how to recognize different, uh, well, specific to staking and airdrop income. Um, they they kind of talked about it in, in terms of how, of comparing both uh, staking to mining activities, uh, which it's not exactly the same mine. In fact, they've they've discussed before that mining activities may throw you out of being an investment company in the first place because you are now engaging in operating type uh, uh, operating type activities, and it's no longer investment activities. You're actually engaging in uh, the mining, which is part of uh, the actual platform, the cryptocurrency platform, and therefore not so strictly an investment. Uh, company type activity. Uh, there was noted that staking, though, if it's staking is that, you know, just a, a quick review, staking is kind of setting aside and restricting your cryptocurrency uh, so that, and then there will be certain rewards for doing such, uh, which is analogous to securities lending, where you're lending out your securities and then getting return for doing, su doing such. Um, Though they didn't reach a conclusion on how they should treat that, you know, balance sheet balance sheet accounting for staking. I mean, if it was going to be analogous to securities lending, there would be, uh, you know, there would there would be uh, the balance sheet impact for that consistent with securities lending, and then the income as well. Uh, so there was no conclusion reached there. Uh, airdrop was also mentioned. Uh, and then was and we've actually seen, I've seen this in some of mine, and it said that it might be analogous to a spinoff or a stock dividend, which is consistent with the thought process of, of the client that we were working with. Uh, but both issues were tabled and just, just were going to be discussed at a future date. That was probably six months ago. Hopefully, they're going to come up again uh, pretty soon here. Uh, but again. This is just this whole section here was more to get you an idea of where where the industry is heading. And like we mentioned at the very top of this, not a ton of actual updates out there right now. But this is this is kind of the shape of where things are going, um, especially when it comes to cryptocurrency. And we'll talk about SPACs next. So um, related to SPACs and a poll question here. Uh, 
Amy, uh, do you want to go ahead and take it from here? Sure. So the second question for this session, uh, did any of the investments in the funds you worked with have a SPAC-related transaction during 2021? Yes, no, not yet, but we are working through one currently or not applicable. And uh, while you're um, responding, I just want to let you know that uh, you can download a copy of today's slide from the slide deck and handouts window. And we'll also be sending them via email tomorrow along with a recording of the conference. For the funds we've worked with, Jared, I would say probably 90% plus have had some sort of SPAC transaction in their investment portfolio. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely high. Nine, 90 feels high as a number, but I'd say it's probably realistic. It's yeah. popping up in every, every single fund in a certain way. Uh, Amy, do you want to, are we, are we there? We're there. Uh, pretty well split here. Um, yes, no, they're not yet. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I, I would, assuming that this is a relevant type transaction for you, I would assume that it's probably going to be happening sometime soon. Um, but, you know, kind of a quick update of where we started. Where we, we talked a lot about SPACs last year. We talked in depth about what a SPAC is and how it works and what to worry about when you're, when you're, uh, when you're working uh, through one and that sort of thing. And what we did, and I, lo I love going through these stats to just to kind of see the, show the explosive growth here. Um, this is really mm -hmm. just tacking on another year to what we talked about last year, which is last year there were 248, which was triple or sorry, five times what there was in 2019. And now we're double that again this year in 2021. Now to be clear, these are just the SPAC blank check companies that have gone public. They are not, this isn't exactly, um, this isn't exactly, these aren't SPAC, de-SPAC transactions or the acquisition or the acquisitions that happened thereafter. Um, but with this in mind, $152 billion have been invested or uh, in, uh, invested through SPAC IPOs to date um, so far this year. So what's the regulatory environment look like? Well, the SEC is worried about SPACs right now and uh, you might have heard that they put the brakes on a bunch of them back in April. Uh, and this is kind of the the, the dirty kind of uh, the down and dirty details of why they did that. It was a very accounting heavy, very technical uh, kind of issue that they were looking at here. Uh, basically that while these SPACs were going through their, their IPO and their process, uh, they they always issue warrants for the most part. Um, and these warrants uh, go to the initial investors in the SPAC IPO, and they, as a kind of a reward for getting in early. Uh, these were a lot of the time recorded as equity, as you would expect warrants to be on the SPAC books. Uh, however, the SEC was seeing some terms in these warrants that basically that they thought they they feel and is consistent with the guidance that these should be considered liabilities. So they started putting the brakes on a bunch of these SPAC IPOs uh, and mergers because they wanted uh, to investigate further and do restatements if need necessary. And we can kind of you can see the the two major issues that were brought up as these as the accounting uh, kind of the accounting depths of why these happen. One had to do with indexation. Uh, basically, if you're depending, it might depend on who the warrant holder is and the settlement amount might change depending on who the warrant holder is. And then there were some tender offer provision problems as well. Basically, if anything, if the settlement amount was out of the actual company's control at any point, uh, then, that should be that would generally trigger liability treatment, um, and that was putting the brakes on these things. Uh, there feels like it's back up and running, and I know from the SPACs that we work with, this is hot button. People were looking at this very, um, very carefully. But I just wanted to kind of highlight this as kind of why that why that was happening and the the technical issues that were uh, at the forefront there. Uh, what's next? Well. 
With some other things, well, in March, the SEC warned the retail investors to not the, the risks of investing in celebrity-backed SPACs, which you've probably heard about. Um, the uh, Also, the, the most interesting thing is that by April 2022, they're going to have uh, a SPAC rule amendments that are going to be coming out. And where these most likely will be focused, from what I'm reading, is that uh, it'll most likely be related to de spacking activities and what kind of promotion can be done uh, in the kind of the de spacking phase, the phase when the SPAC has chosen a merger candidate and when they actually complete the merger. Uh, there's a lot of rules around IPOs during that during a similar phase, but since these are merger activities, the lose the, the rules on disclosure and and what you can do to promote are very loosey goosey. Uh, and uh, SPACs are taking advantage of those. The SEC does not like that. Um, so that is kind of where the most likely they're going to be going, but who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll see in April. Uh, Jared, we got a couple We got a couple slides left. We're going to end right on time because the rest of this is pretty pretty light. Yep. No, this, these last two are just little quick refreshers. So I'm talking about the Cayman Island filing updates. Um, it's just a re uh, reflection of the fact that it did happen in 2021. These filings were required as part of SEMA or the Cayman Island Monetary Authority. Um, annual financial statements and other information was required to be filed starting in 2021. With that requirement, there were uh, financial statements had to be audited by a firm and filed by a firm local in Cayman. And just looking at the history of the deadlines that they gave, the original due date was June 2020, but then it got pushed back to September 30th and ultimately got pushed back all the way to October 31st. Um, while it was somewhat bumpy and seeing all those extensions happening in 2021, we aren't expecting those to happen in 2022. So now I think SEMA is going to anticipate that people have this process in place and 2022 should be able to run um, without a hitch. So, Ryan, go ahead yeah, and finish well, it off with uh, independence. Yeah, and while SEMA was having maybe some trouble figuring it out and kept pushing back the deadlines, um, the, from our experience, it was a pretty seamless transition. It was a little, our, our, our Cayman office was able to pick those up and issue those pretty much no problem on time. Uh, it, it did add an extra layer of admin for us, but we were able, it wasn't that, that onerous uh, on our, you know, our process. And I don't think we had any major issues or anything like that. So. So a little bit of commentary about how that went. Hopefully it'll go even better this next year. Um, real quick, this is not new. This is not an update. I do want to put that out there. This is more of a, a reminder or fresher, mostly because I do continue to see, I, I don't want to say confusion, but definitely some some conflicting kind of information out there in the in the in the marketplace. And this has to do with auditor independence. Um, as you probably know, registered investment advisors are subject to the custody rule, and you can satisfy the custody rule through many different ways, but what's most relevant is by getting a private fund that is subject to the custody rule audited on an annual basis, uh, and that requires to, uh, to maintain SEC-level independence. SEC-level independence is more rigorous than our kind of normal independence. That's AICPA-level independence. Um, and that the, where this comes, where this is an issue is that it restricts non-audit services that we can provide to clients to maintain that SEC level independence and includes the investment company complex as well, which might include brother, sister funds, uh, and also investment companies kind of down the chain as well. And this is where we see the most kind of potential conflict of interest or independence issues. Um, these independence restrictions generally extend to the investing companies, private equity funds, uh, and other affiliated funds. And, but the main issue that we have is like the tax and quality of earnings work is fine for these issues, for the, for those, uh, other entities down the chain. However, certain non-addict functions like systems implementations and financial statement preparation are not allowed. This is for the fund and investment companies down, the, you know, within the complex. So, just want to just want to highlight that real quick. I, if you have any questions, I, I can talk about this all day. This is one slide. I just want to make sure it's out there and that we understand it. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that if you have a venture capital exemption from registration, this is not 
applicable to you. And this is one thing that we want to be very careful about while we're um, while we're going through our independence uh, considerations ourselves. Is are, is this a venture capital exemption or is this a full on RIA registration? Uh, this applies to that full on RIA registration. None of the exemptions would be present. Um, so if you're an exempt reporting advisor, this is not for you. This is for those full on registered investment advisors. Here's the final poll question as we're wrapping up. Uh, do you want to put an, an ad out for the breakouts that are coming up right now? So what breakout are you attending right now? Uh, Amy, do you want to launch it? Sure. So it's, it's up. Uh, which breakout session are you going to attend? Fund structuring trends, current trends with PE transactions, or the ESG investing? And also, while you're responding, I do want to let you know we have a survey uh, link in your slide deck and handouts window of your console. So any feedback you have uh, is greatly appreciated. And here are the results, Syed. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Jared. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, so uh, that concludes uh, the second day of our conference. Uh, the sessions are eligible for CPE. Um, so I would like to thank all our speakers today for, for what I would think was a very insightful discussion. Um, so on your right side of your console, you'll see the breakout options. Uh, please pick one of the three fund structuring trends uh, B, uh, trend with PE transaction and ESG. Again, you don't have to keep your cameras on. You don't have to participate really uh, or it really depends on how you want to uh, interact. So I highly encourage you to pick one of the three. And if, if you want to change any of the sessions, you can always exit and re-enter a different session. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude our 2021 conference. Thank you so much for attending. Your CP credits will be uh, sent out to you shortly. Uh, there will be replays available, including the handouts. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, we do have a couple of questions that we'll come come and come back and answer. But that's it. Thanks so much for attending, and I'll see you in one of the breakouts. Bye.